My business is Stonyfield Farm Yogurt. We started it in 1983, so we're celebrating our 25th year. So the background here is that uh, by 1996, I had 297 shareholders. We had sold many, many uh, shares in our company over the years, and many of those shareholders had in turn sold to others. So uh, I started looking for exits. It was about that time that, of course, Ben and Jerry's were going through their uh, transition. And uh, the one thing I knew for sure is I didn't want to take the company public. We did explore that option. We also, I also knew that I wanted to stay with the company. I had no desire to exit. So we began a process at about 1998 that took about two years where we explored all kinds of different options. And around um, 2000, I settled in on the idea of striking a joint venture where I would sell off or provide an exit for all of the shareholders who were trying to get out. Um, but at the same time, I would still retain control. Uh, I brought that proposal to probably 25 different companies, um, including uh, Unilever, who uh, I introduced actually to Ben and Jerry's, um, because we quickly figured out that we had no common ground with them. But they desired an introduction, and of course, Dryers had already come in now and made their hostile offer. Ultimately, we closed our deal in December of 2001 after two years of negotiations. So the nature of our deal was that uh, from a management, from a control, from an operating point of view, nothing would change. The only uh, involvement that Danone would have would be uh, what I desired uh, them to have. We had three uh, specific uh, veto rights that we granted them. One was that we couldn't acquire any businesses without their approval. Second, we couldn't go into any other businesses, uh, e expand out of yogurt, uh, or dairy without uh, their okay. And third, we couldn't do any capex over a million dollars without their okay. Now that latter one turns out to be uh, a place where they were more prescient than I was. Um, by them controlling my capex, what they knew uh, and I didn't was that as a $78 million company at that time, we're now $300 million, I was going to be facing hundreds of millions of dollars of capex. And so therefore, that's in fact how they have a, a strong degree of control over me. On the other hand, um, uh, in other words, I couldn't have expanded CapEx without their approval. On the other hand, since I needed the CapEx to grow, in fact, I kind of had them over the barrel as well. And that it speaks to what I really think is the best kind of deal, where both sides have each other in a kind of a creative tension. Um, there's no doubt about it, to cut to the quick here, that my independence uh, and my ability to keep running much as I had been running for the prior, at that point, 18 years, is and was and always will be completely dependent on my performance. What we agreed to with them is that we would hit certain targets. And obviously, I set targets that I knew I would beat. Uh, and from their point of view, in our document, which is yay thick, um, we agreed that the deal, uh, they would have no interference, no involvement, as long as I met those minimums. So to give you a feel for it, we had about, uh, we were, had been growing at around 20%, actually 25% on a compounded annual basis for about a decade prior to doing this deal. We agreed that we would continue to grow at between 10 and 15%, seemed like a pretty safe, safe number, and that that growth would decline over time. We have subsequently, as you can imagine, beaten the heck out of those targets. We also at that time had a middle single digit, high middle single digit uh, EBITDA, and we agreed that we would gradually build our EBITDA up to a desired target, which is around 13 or 14 percent. And again, we've smashed that objective as well. So the bottom line is, is that Dunant, you could say, well, why were they willing to do this? Buy 80 percent of the company, uh, leave me with complete and total autonomy, 60% board control. Obviously, they have two of the five board seats. And the answer is that they were completely mystified by the organic business. They didn't understand our model, which is a model of much lower gross margin. Because again, our mission is to keep family farmers supported at a very high level. So we pay a very high cost of goods. Uh, by, by our own admission, we pay well over the conventional market, which is our whole mission, to pay more for milk, sugar, fruit, and so on, to keep farmers viable. And so the net result of that is that we have um, probably 10 gross margin points of difference between, say, Dannon and Stonyfield. We're a full 10 points below them. 
and again at a $300 million business, that's a lot of money. But reciprocally, below the line, down in the overheads, we are much, much less expensive than them. We're leaner, we're meaner, uh, we, are, um, we spend far, far less on advertising and on purchased media because our entire business model, which I describe in my book, is based upon building loyalty. Once you have loyalty, and in my 25 years of hindsight now I can say this, once you have loyalty, you have much stronger word of mouth, uh, much uh, uh, lower cost of acquiring new consumers because our consumers are acquiring them, them themselves. And I'm no longer dependent on this enormous amount of uh, outpouring of dollars to keep uh, spending just to hold, to hold steady. When consumers come into the store, they're looking to buy at least organic, if not Stonyfield, not just yogurt. Whereas Dannon and Yoplait and the others have to spend just to hold their own. The other thing is, is that we have a long history of managing the trade's expectations. Um, because we're not a high spending brand, the trade knows that we're not going to spend at those levels. And that means lower overheads as well. So the net of this is that we have a very foreign and mysterious business model to them that keeps working. My 19-year um, compounded annual growth rate is 26.7% in a category that has grown 3 to 5%. So they have absolutely no qualms with how we're doing. Again, we went from $78 million in sales when we started negotiating to over $300 million this year. We will be a half a billion dollar company soon enough. We've also launched organic in several other countries, in France, England, Ireland, Canada. And I'm now involved with acquisitions and uh, further investments on their part so uh, around the world. So our value to them is far greater than just my P&L. We had a number of people helping us with our negotiations. And just by background, I need to uh, explain that, again, I had 297 shareholders. They owned 80% of the company. I controlled or owned 15 to 20 percent. Um, so I had a board of directors and I had several members of the board uh, who were very eager to get an exit at this point and very eager to take advantage of the incredible multiples that were being thrown at the industry. I had no obligation, this is a very important point, I had no legal obligation to provide them with an exit, but they were agitating and they were frankly pains in the ass and I needed to get them out. Uh, at least these, a couple of these individuals. And for the rest, it was people like family and friends who had gotten in very, very early who I felt a moral obligation to provide an exit to. I, however, had no desire to exit other than perhaps liquidating a you know, few million dollars of shares to do other creative things, which I've subsequently done. It, initially, the board created a special committee to interview bankers. And at first, and this was prior to the Ben & Jerry's, uh, Dreyer's, uh, Unilever nightmare, uh, we started looking seriously at going public. And we spent about a year interviewing bankers. Ultimately, we decided that we would hire Adams, Harkness, and Hill. But as we were closing in on that final decision after meeting Piper Jaffrey and H&Q and all the others, and we looked at DPOs, uh, direct public offerings, um, that's when I realized I didn't want to sell, take the company public. And that's when the Dryers, B&Js thing started happening, happening. And that's when I knew I didn't want to go public. So at that point, we turned our attention with those same bankers to finding a deal like I've described, where we could do a joint venture where we would sell a majority of ownership but not yield a majority of control. And at that point, we knew that the bankers who we had interviewed to go public were not the appropriate bankers for that deal. So we started another round. And after talking to a number of them, we ultimately settled on Lazard Frere, a guy named Jim Gold, who has actually recently uh, moved into semi-retirement and is, in fact is an advisor uh, for a number of other companies in the organic space I've introduced him to. Um, and Jim, when I, when I hit him with our proposal, I said I'd like to uh, do this deal um, where we'll sell 80% of the company but I'll still have 60% control. He said, well that's impossible and it will never happen, but I'd really like to try to help you make it happen. I'd like to, gi I'd like to give it a try. And it was just that willingness on his part within the sort of banker rigidity and his honesty that led me to engage him. Now we did still keep Adams, Harkness and Hill on as uh, sort of peripheral advisors and they did continue to help us uh, but fundamentally uh, Jim uh, was there. Now I need to say that in terms of your question of what advice did I get, truthfully I didn't get a lot of advice from Lazard Frere. In fact what we really tapped into was their Rolodex 
And if I was adver advising other entrepreneurs on this process, uh, I would say that that's primarily what you get from a banker. If you're, if you're intent on holding on to your values and doing your own thing and doing it your way and remaining independent and staying involved, then you should really strike very different terms than I did. This, if I was going to do anything differently, I would have made a much more thrifty deal. Uh, instead of paying whatever it was, several percentage, single digit percentage points on the deal to Lazard, I would have done a single percentage point because that's all I was really paying for is, is the introduction. And in the end, neither the, the buyer, Danan, or the seller, Stonyfield in this case, actually wanted uh, the banker involved. This was an intricate, intimate, personal undertaking. And as you might imagine, in the two years that followed that introduction, as we continued to negotiate, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, credit where it's due, the best advice I actually got was from an M&A guy at Danan, who I later learned had been told, get this deal done at any cost. <laughs> I wish I had known that at the time. Uh, this guy, who has also subsequently moved out of Danan and is on his own, and who I could recommend to emerging uh, values-driven brands as a fabulous advisor, his name was Nicholas. Uh, continuing to run the company with these values. And their advice was just go patient, take it slow, leave nothing on the table, don't make too many decisions at once. Now, I should also mention one other key part of our negotiation. When we began the deal, Danan actually gave us a lowball price. It was too low. I knew it wouldn't satisfy the exit appetite of my investors. Um, I wasn't really so much concerned about the money because I knew I was going to stay with it and grow the thing. But I knew I had to get top dollar for my investors. And I also knew I had to be a role model for other companies entering into this kind of relationship that it was possible. And so we walked away from the table immediately then. And there was about a three-month period where we continued to talk to other, other sellers. That brought Danon back to the table because they knew I, I wasn't calling them. When they finally came back to the table, I said, look, this is the price. Let's get that out of the way right away. Hit them with a the price. Uh, they agreed to it. And then we commenced the next year and three quarters of detailed uh, discussions. Keep in mind that we closed in December of 2001. Um, in the time since then, the multiples for organic and natural foods companies have soared. We did very well. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think we did something like uh, uh, 25 times EBIT. Um, and uh, we did something like one and a half or 1.6 times revenues. The problem was that during the year and three quarters um, that we continued to negotiate after setting the price, Stonyfield grew. So I would do several things differently. First, I would set it on a, on a uh, multiple uh, ratio basis, not on a fixed number. Because again, if I had set it on the ratio, we would have probably gotten our investors even a higher um, deal. Danan already agreed to those multiples. And the second is that I would seek higher multiples, period, because in the time since then, what's happened in the natural and organic field is that there's uh, all of the best companies have been bought up or have exited. And so there's now a shortage, a supply shortage. And in fact, I sit on several boards and we know that as soon as companies reach the, let's call it 15 or $20 million threshold, Instantly, that's when the vultures come swooping in. This is true whether it's in France, the UK, Ireland, Canada, or the US, and frankly, now we're seeing it in uh, South America and, and, and Asia as well. Uh, in other words, um, there's, a sh there's a paucity or a shortage of deal flow, and this drives the values up. And it's also an extremely competitive marketplace, especially if you're in, say, organic beverages, which is just out of control. So. Um, we did comparability analyses. The guy who was on my board who was very eager to get a, uh, an exit and very eager to drive value, he would produce for me almost weekly transaction analyses. I would be sure I did that. But I would also, again, push to the very high end of the spectrum, not the average. You know, when you do these multiple analyses, they'll show you high, low, and average. Forget about average. If you've got an intact business, if uh, the growth prospects are excellent, as ours have been and were and have been. If your um, performance is uh, something uh, that they uh, are not obtaining themselves, 
then go to the absolute top of the spectrum and just stay put there and they will get to you. The key values that we wanted to protect were numerous. Uh, to start with, we wanted absolutely no one to dictate how we managed our supply chain, our farmers. Um, if you look at a history of how dairy farmers have been supported on the conventional basis, you will see, and Ben and Jerry's is part of this, as, as are many others, it just goes like this. It's just an oscillation up and down, up and down. The, dairy, the, the typical family dairy farmer in the Northeast, let alone the whole U.S., has really not advanced their economic fortunes in the 25 years that I've been in business. If you look at organic pricing, it goes like this. Um, we have protected that. We, uh, though Dan Danon and Danon, of course, globally buy lots and lots and lots of milk, we, have, we didn't want their supply chain or their purchasing to have anything to do with how we negotiated. We wanted that to be between us and the farms, so we needed to protect that relationship. We wanted to protect our profits for the planet program, where 10% of our after-tax profits go, are given to environmental causes. Um, Danon and we ultimately negotiated a cap on that, but that was only after I would exit the company. As long as I'm running the company, and that means either CEO or chairman, uh, there would be no cap on that. So we have, of course, more than doubled our profits as a percentage of sales in these six years, and of course, massively Im increased them as, uh, as uh, the company has grown, and, and that means we've been able to give away millions and millions of dollars. Uh, we wanted the freedom to be able to uh, hire, structure, organize uh, our bonus program as we saw fit, not according to the Denon HR. Probably one of the more pernicious um, things that we've had to uh, watch out for in this relationship is because we are ultimately, our results are consolidated with Danans, the financial structure of our company has had to uh, adjust to theirs. We've had to talk the same terms. So we've, of course, had to um, synchronize our uh, P&L and all of the financial metrics. There's a very gray and fine line between how you organize your financial metrics and your reporting and how you govern your HR. Uh, head counts, percentage of revenues uh, on, uh, that are spent on benefits. In other words, all of the typical indices, um, we're way out of line with Danans. There's been a lot of pressure on us to align them. Uh, but we have a very different bonus program. For example, 100% of my, company, my employees, when they come in and get oriented, they're introduced to something called the MAP process. It's the Mission Action Plan, where they're literally instructed on how we as a company are trying to reduce our climate footprint and what the financial returns are. And they're invited to join one of 10 teams where they get bonus based on their ability to reduce climate footprint, whether it's logistics or purchasing or manufacturing. That's totally foreign to Danan. Uh, the percentage that we offer as a percentage of uh, compensation, uh, because again, we break out and, and highly value environmental criteria. Uh, that's very foreign to Danan. And so we badly wanted to protect our HR policies. The other thing uh, that we wanted to protect was uh, we wanted to have the ability to compete with Danon. And this gets to be a whole other area of discussion, which I wish I was with you all. I could go into some, I could elaborate on this, but the short version is that we did not want Danon to dictate our position in the marketplace, our shelf position, our uh, SKUs. We wanted to be able to compete directly. Um, and we also wanted to be able to govern our own relationships with the trade. Um, that was harder fought and won. And in fact, very interestingly, in the last year, we've actually begun to integrate our sales forces, but with Stonyfield dictating pricing, trade spending, positioning, sales strategy, vertical and horizontal uh, strategy, etc. We religiously documented all of the things that we were trying to protect, right down to the details of uh, this. Uh, the way that we structured our deal was that initially we agreed to sell 40% of the selling shareholder stock to Danan. Uh, what we did was we had the shareholders, the 80% holders of our company, put all of their stock into escrow but only 40% was made available. That accomplished two things. One, it kept them as a minority investor. Number two, it kept us from being consolidated into their books. And we did that with a two-year window and laid out very explicit, detailed synergies that they had to bring forward. 
things that they had to do to provide uh, data at lower cost, uh, selling um, entree into uh, previously exclusive accounts for them, uh, logistics uh, overlaps, and so forth and so on. And they had a punch list that they had to successfully accomplish in those two years. If they successfully knocked off 100% of those, and I think there were 10 or 12 covenants, then I would affirmatively uh, agree that the proxied, I'm sorry, that the escrowed shares would then roll over and they would then become the owners of 80% and it would consolidate, but only then. So we highly legislated the first two years, as you well know now, historically. Uh, they did meet all those criteria. We did flip it over, but at that point, we had already negotiated a deal document that was probably two inches thick that spelled out very specifically all of these terms, explicitly laying out. My, my, my concern was that I obviously knew that the senior management at Denon was uh, supportive. Uh, we spent, again, a year and three quarters really working this out. We got to know each other. I flew over there. They flew over here. We negotiated it. We, it really became sort of a couple of siblings working together, one being slightly bigger than the other, albeit. Um, my concern was that they could be acquired, that one of them could disappear, or several of them could disappear, and I could find myself across the table from somebody very, very different. Uh, and so I needed to legislate, I needed to gen genetically encode into the DNA of this deal my own requirements, so that if it wound up being Unilever or Nestle or who knows who, uh, that this, this stuff would be protected. And indeed, uh, with poison pills, by the way, if they abused it, because of course there was always the risk that they would uh, just try to fight me in court and I would never have the muscle. We had the agreement that we could buy back the company if they failed to deliver, or if they interfered, or if they sold. Uh, that was the kind of thing that was legislated. So it was a very complex deal. This, by the way, um, is something I, I should have mentioned. We, we um, had a very, very strong legal counsel on our side. Um, Steve Palmer of um, Kirkpatrick and uh, Lockhart in Boston, I highly recommend him. I've met some other attorneys on the deal side, on the sell side since, who I could also recommend. Uh, Steve was absolutely religious. He had been with me for 15 years. He really did save the day. Um, and that, that was a critical, critical part of all of this. Uh, but we religiously labored over language, semantics, terminology. I mean, I was a complete pain in the ass through this whole thing because I was terrified. And I knew that uh, in the end, I had to have the best legal vertebrae that I could because in the end I was not going to be able to beat them in a, in a, in a lawsuit. Um, they, um, there were no role models for me in, in terms of this deal, nor are there role models for many of the deals that I'm counseling now because everyone is so case specific. I'm on the board of a beverage company that's involved in a uh, high level negotiation right now and we're crafting the deal from scratch and I can tell you it's got a lot of overlaps with Stonyfields. But because this is personal, because this is values driven, because this is about ethics, not just finances, you have to take the time and be patient. And they have, the buyer have to, has to be patient. And of course, you protect the buyer with a quiet period and so forth and so on. But you also have to be able to get up, be ready to get up from the table and walk away if it's not going the way you want. But, but I guess my simple way of summarizing all of this is two, two points. One, if you don't ask, you don't get. And you can't ask later. You've got to ask them. So get it into the deal. Think hard. What is it? Get your friends, your family, whomever around you, and have them poke at you. Say, Gary or, or um, Barry or you know, you know, uh, Martha, you know, what's most important to you? And make sure you get that down. And the second thing is that performance in the end is what keeps the relationship honest. Uh, we've all seen many, many deals. The reason that you all are gathered together is because a lot of these companies have had their values obliterated or neutered or mediocritized or commoditized or whatever. Um, if you don't perform, then you run the risks of all of that happening. But as long as you perform and operate with religious adherence to the financial objectives that you set mutually, then uh, your independence is guaranteed. In Stonyfield's case, uh, we have attempted, we knew m for many, many years before I did this deal that other companies would be trying to acquire us. And so we have been religious almost from the moment of my first becoming profitable in early 90s, um, that we needed to genetically encode our values into what we do. That's why our packaging has my signature on it. 
That's why our packaging talks about synthetic growth hormones and organics and the fact that we give 10% of our profits to um, uh, uh, environmental causes. By encoding this stuff, by making it a part of the brand and the brand identity, it becomes impossible, at least in our view, we hoped it would become impossible to peel those away. In other words, the brand can't stand separate from the values. And in hindsight, I can now tell you that's absolutely been the case. Um, you, I could look at some other very high quality brands, uh, look at Honest Tea as an example, uh, look at uh, Patagonia. Now, these are examples where, again, uh, uh, look at Cliff Bar. The mission is deeply encoded into who that product is in the minds of the consumer and the investor and the trade. I can see other brands, and I probably shouldn't name names here, where it was more contrived, where it was just marketing, where there was a high talk-do ratio. And candidly, in those cases, those brands have been neutered. They're not what they were when the founders ran them. Uh, the question is, do I have an exit strategy for myself? And I suppose as long as I keep eating organic yogurt, I'll postpone that ultimate exit, you know, um, meaning that we're all compost sooner or later. And I think that is my exit. Um, in other words, um, I love what I'm doing. It's completely exciting. Um, my purchase power and reach now is far, far greater than the sum of my $300 million company. Not to, not to mention we'll be a half a billion or even a billion before too long. But more importantly, I'm now influencing Danone's own purchasing. I'm influencing their sustainability practices. I'm meeting with the highest level supply chain, suppliers and customers of theirs and ours around the world. Um, one thing that did change in my deal was uh, my original deal was written that I would remain in control of the board for as long as I was president and CEO. And two years ago, I renegotiated uh, to include as long as I was president, CEO, or chairman. And my own strategy, personal strategy, is over time to gradually wean myself out of day-to-day -day management and be more the chair and uh, kind of visionary uh, more involved in acquisition, uh, new product development, uh, you know, the fun stuff, uh, geographic expansion. Uh, you know, I'm working on, a, I'm on a board with Muhammad Yunus right now, working on this incredible uh, dairy operation in uh, Bangladesh. Um, that's the kind of role that I envision for myself going forward. By the way, it's the kind of role Danan envisions for me. Uh, but the beauty of striking that slight change in the deal is that I, as the 60% majority um, manager, can still determine who the CEO is going to be, who's going to actually run it. Uh, so no, I have no exit strategy whatsoever. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're leaving our kids a really messy planet. And I am absolutely convinced, as I describe in my book, that business is actually the only hope for our kids. I, retirement for me is copping out, waving the white flag, and surrendering. Uh, to this mess. Uh, I think that uh, running this business and continuing to drive it and continuing to have this position of influence is the most important thing I could possibly do for my kids and I think I'll be doing it until my last exhalation. You know, I, I'm again really regretting that I couldn't take the time to be with you all but I think uh, an important thing that I want to say not just to you in this particular discussion about succession but to our entire progressive business community is that we don't have the time anymore to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, don't hold out for every single thing, every last detail. You know, Walmart does plenty of bad things, but they're doing incredibly good things. Uh, I urge you to read my book because we've got to capitalize on where these companies are doing well because, well, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says that we've got only a decade now, by the way, nine years, they said it a year ago, to adjust the trajectory of CO2 emissions to something sustainable. We are, we are organics. We're proud of all we've accomplished. We've got a $17.5 billion industry, but we're only 2.5% of foods that are out there. So while I encourage uh, you to think about and create ways that we can encode a kind of a blueprint and master plan for emerging organic brands and how they can protect their values and so forth, I ask that you not be fascistic and set, um, you know, ridiculous objectives that are above the, the reach of practicality. I agreed with Denon. I would achieve growth. That's, after all, how they're measured. Um, I know many of us in the sustainability field, that field feel that growth is evil. 
It's not. It's the way the world works. And there's not time to change that. We're not going to get rid of capitalism. We're not going to get rid of Walmart. We're not going to get rid of Dow Chemical, GE, or the others. What we've got to do is inoculate, get into them, and convert them with a different ethical code. And that ethical code, the happy news, as I point out in my book, uh, uh, is um, you know, you can make more money being green. At $100 a barrel oil, headed to $200 a barrel, you know, it was only $32 a barrel when Bush came in. We are heading for a world in which green is the only way to make money. So we've got the wind at our sails. Let's not hold out for, for absolutism. Let's integrate and infuse these companies. Uh, and this is how we'll actually leave something for our kids. Uh, we also negotiated for, we were in, in, in conversations for about a year and a half as well. And I, I think I called off the deal probably five or six times. And I'm surprised that they had the patience, you know, to, to continue, continue talking with me when I call them again, because I was a total pain in the ass. Was this, is this Hershey's? Yeah, with Hershey's. Yeah. And I, you know, we asked if they would be willing to do all these different um, you know, deals in terms of selling, you know, only 40%, 50%, 60%, 70%, whatnot, and it was all or nothing. Thought, they they weren't even willing to let you have 10%? No. <laughs> My question is what happens when Gary leaves the scene after he's chairman and so forth? Is it a self-sustaining contract or is it all personified to him? Well, what, what happens after him? Well, obviously he maintains control of his ownership of his stock, goes to his estate or whatever, but it's, it ends, Ron. It ends at that point, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And so that's something to think about, isn't it? It does not continue on after Gary's gone, it appears. At Ben & Jerry's, as you'll discover tomorrow, Ben & Jerry's has a contract that lives in perpetuity. So that's nice on that scale. But as I think all the board members here will notice, there's a lot of things Gary got that we didn't get in our deal, too. And so there's a lot to learn from this. Is there anything else? Yeah, Don. Well, I, I might be taking this the wrong way, but I, I feel like um, I, I kind of resent the way he framed things towards the end there, that the only really valid theory of change, given climate change, um, is to inoculate and, and to reform multinationals from within, as opposed to trying to create alternative ways of looking at things and creating things like local living economies, even if it takes a little longer, even if they're more. I, I kind of resent being called a fascist if I don't want to buy into his theory of change. So just short comment there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? addition, you know, if he was that interested in inoculation, how was he going to set up the metric to see if he was successful about inoculation? What changes are happening in Danone that are actually affecting climate change or whatever other social issues he might be interested in? It, it, it'd be interesting to ask him that question to see whether or not the inoculation is taking. Mm -hmm. Is the model working? Because I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't you know, we have a Unilever present, but inoculation is hard. <laughs> Greg Christie, come back to you. Um, well, this, with Gary speaking, I think it brings out the um, important aspect of the entrepreneur and the role of the entrepreneur. I, I mean, it raises as many issues as solutions that Gary himself has provided uh, through his intense entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial will. So um, I, I think it, it, it does set up for later in our discussions uh, the role uh, the, and, and, and maybe some parsing out of the role of company cultures and the role of the entrepreneur in relationship to those cultures. Then how do you make those things, uh, some of those aspects enduring beyond individual personalities and, uh, you know, will, acts of will. So there's, um, I think, a, a lot of pieces that this conversation is going to open up that, th you know, obviously we're only going to be able to scratch the surface. So uh, I, I, I think it's an exciting um, 
kind of opener uh, to raise as many questions and, and also uh, just to, to, to Don's point, uh, question, even in the way this was phrased, Terry, not so much the inevitability of selling out, but through this uh, conversation to ask questions about uh, can we design for other alternatives? Because I think it's the design principle um, that Gary actually used, but we can apply the, de the design principle maybe a little bit earlier in earlier stages and avoid you know, some kind of inevitability thinking. I'm just going to tack on to that, that uh, if I look at it from Danan's point of view, I spent a year and three quarters getting to know Gary Hirschberg. Obviously, people would end up including Gary Hirschberg, a very astute business person, really knows this space in terms of the organic products. It was a very good investment for me as Danan to invest in Gary Hirschberg. The trade-off was, when Gary, you're gone, I get it. And so what Danan said, okay, I'm going to give you whatever you want because you're worth putting my money behind you. But in exchange, when you're gone, I get it all. And that seems to be the Danan uh, perspective in this, in my judgment. Two points. One is that it's interesting that um, I think he figured out what he wanted, some baseline pieces that he wanted out of the agreement, and had to shop for people that were going to help him get it. So he had to shop for bankers. and then offered some people that might be useful to folks that are going through the same thing. The other was that I was really wondering how long the sell process took, the entire process. I know for us it was, eight, it was 18 months. We were led to believe that that was a long time. Um, <laughs> but I'm hearing 18 months a lot in these discussions, so I'm just interested about that. I don't know if you want to speak to that. I mean, there are many transactions which are done uh, you know, in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, by my way of thinking, 18 months is a very long time. But I do think in a transaction like this, where someone has to get a feel for the other company's culture, mm -hmm. and you have to build up some degree of trust, because the best agreement in the world still requires some good faith and trust between parties, you do need a longer period of time on this kind of transaction. I, I know that it was even longer than what he said because I was talking to Gary while we were doing the Ben and Jerry's deal mm -hmm. and that was in 2000 and he'd already been talking for quite a while at that point and he didn't sell the company until the end of 2001. Walt. Uh, just, uh, just one other point which is, I think is when we talk about strategies and what worked and didn't work in selling without selling out I think the founders will have one view and the people negotiating the deal will have one view. There will be other perspectives and I've seen this for example at Ben and Jerry's where you know you may talk to one group of individuals who negotiated the agreement. And typically the people who negotiate the agreement think it was a pretty astute agreement in a lot of different ways. Um, and then you talk to employees. Now these are the people who you know very often when the founders move on or the people who negotiated the agreement move on are left there with what was negotiated. And they may at times have very different perspectives on, uh, on the wisdom, the correctness, the, 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 uh, the effectiveness with which the, min, the mission was maintained as a result of the way the deal was negotiated. So I just wanted to offer that perspective that, um, that the, any one perspective on this, be it the founder's perspective, the acquirer's perspective, the people who negotiated the deal, the employees, the suppliers, the customers will all have very different views, I think, at times, uh, and even consumers of, of, in fact, whether a company was true to its values in, uh, in how it negotiated its deal uh, in the long term. And very often, only the long term will tell. So just wanted to share yeah, that. Yeah, it's good, it's great. Okay, I think, anything else? The Ben & Jerry's thing was, was, was really so different because, I mean, Walt listed a bunch of people, but there, were, uh, there was a management of the company that was very eager to sell it. And so, so the, 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 it, was a very, it was a much, much different situation. He, he was driving it 
some from his own thing, but some for a few people that he knew that he, that he had to get an exit strategy for. Our thing was so totally a different scenario, a night and day different scenario, I think, than from, uh, from what he had to go through. And I guess we'll go over tomorrow where we, we kind of ended up. But um, I, think, I think to understand where we ended up, you really have to spend some time, and I don't know whether we'll have enough time, understanding everything that was going on in terms of us internally and the external forces.